All right, so that's the topic, uh, that's the title of my sermon this morning. The title of my sermon is The Evidence of Salvation. The Evidence of Salvation. There's a lot of wrong ideas out there, and I'm hoping this sermon will correct some of those ideas. If even in yourself, you may have some wrong ideas on how you judge whether you are saved or how you judge whether somebody else is saved. Obviously, that is impossible because uh, you cannot see their heart. But a lot of people doubt their own salvation because of the wrong reasons, and that's what I'm hoping to clear up in this sermon this morning. So the part I want to focus on in 1 John 5 that we read through is in verse 13. Uh, This is one of the passages we use when we go out soul winning. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, when we go out soul winning, a lot of Catholics and a lot of Orthodox people do not know that this verse is in the Bible. And they've been taught their whole life that you cannot know whether or not you're going to heaven. You ask them, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And they'll say, well, nobody can know. Right? Nobody can. Only God knows whether or not I'll be in heaven when I die. But the Bible says, and we show them this passage, did you know that the Bible says that one of the reasons why John is writing this passage in 1 John 5 is he says, hey, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So if you believe on the name of the Son of God, you believe on Jesus Christ, he's saying here, hey, you can know that you have eternal life. You can know. Not just God can know. Not just, you know, nobody can know. No, he's saying no, you, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So the Bible gives us that assurance that not only God knows who is saved, but we can know that we are saved. And that is a blessed thing because, you know, if God loves us, if God like, wants us to be his children, and he communicated with us, why would he not want us to know that we're saved? Why would he want to leave us in a state where we're wondering, will God still send me to hell? Have I, have I earned God's grace? Am I going to heaven? Am I going to be with God when I die? I mean, what sort of God would put his children in that situation if he loves them? He'd want them to know. And that's why we can know. We can have that assurance. So we have that assurance because we believe on Jesus Christ. But then people ask the question, and and, and usually incorrectly because they're judging salvation by the wrong reasons, then they'll ask the question, how do I know that I truly believe? Right? That's, what, that's what they'll say. So they'll say, okay, I know that I'm saved because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to have faith on Jesus Christ. But then they ask, people ask the question, and this is where the wrong teaching starts to come in, right? Because when they talk about the evidence of salvation, they're really talking about the evidence of faith. You know, what's going to happen? What, what's the evidence going to show when somebody actually truly believes? So it makes people ask themselves the question. It makes them doubt their salvation because well, I, I think I believe. And they say, well, how do I know I truly believe? And this is where the wrong teaching starts to come in. So I'm going to go through five wrong ways people judge their own salvation. And this is also five reasons why people doubt their salvation for the wrong reasons. Right? Five wrong reasons why people doubt their salvation. So the first one is circumstances. Now, what do I mean by circumstances? I'm talking about the events either leading up to the point you get saved or maybe the circumstances after you you get saved. Um, So people, some people might say something like this. They might say, you know, I don't think I believed the right way. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I've I've had people say that to me, like, you know, I believe, but did did I do it right? You know, did I, did I, did I, did, they think that it's like there's these certain specific actions that have to take place, you know, before you, and that means that you believed correctly. But this is not how it works, right? There, there is no, you know, is there a right and wrong way to believe? You know, you either believe or you don't. It's not that there's a right way to get there. But people say this because they're referring, right, to the events leading up to that point of belief. But what I want you to know this morning is it doesn't matter how you get to the point of belief. All that matters for salvation is that you do believe. Right? How you get there. Everyone gets there different ways. Right? If you think about people's testimonies, when you hear about somebody's testimony, that's how they came 
to saving faith by putting their faith on Jesus Christ, but their testimony is explaining all the different circumstances that led to that point where they finally decided, you know what, I'm going to put my faith on Jesus. And that might be, you know, you watched something here or you spoke to somebody or you went to an event, somebody went to church or you met this person and met that person and you read this and it's all these different circumstances but ultimately we all get saved the same way. And the way you can think of it is in 1 John, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So if you think of salvation like walking through a door, I mean, you know, it's like here. Today you came to church and you walked through a door to get into this building. And you guys all came from different parts. You know, you, you maybe you know, some people got a lift and some people drove themselves. Some people came late, right? <laughs> but they still came through the door. So you think of salvation. Hey, some people come different ways. Some people come later in life, right? Some people come early in life. But how you get to the door doesn't matter. Right? As long as you get through that door, as long as you walk through that door, how do you walk through the spiritual door of salvation? You believe on Jesus Christ. So, right? so it doesn't matter how you get there, it just matters that you go through the door. So what's some examples where people you know, ask themselves questions in doubt? They might say, well, I, I don't know when I got saved. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So salvation is likened to being born. You know that some people don't know their birthday? They don't know when they were born. You know, they don't have a their birth certificate to remind them. But does that mean they're not born? No, so you can know that you're saved now if you believe. You may not know when you first believed, but if you believe now, you know. So you don't need to know the specific day and time of your salvation as long as you believe now you know that you're inside the building even though maybe you didn't really know how you got when you came in so not everyone knows their birthday date but that doesn't mean they they weren't born now the bible tells us in order to be saved we need to call upon the name of the lord right that's how we go to somebody who's invisible right that's how we believe on them we go to them by calling upon them this is what romans 10 teaches for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved. So I'll come back to this passage a bit later. But we call upon the Lord to be saved. Now sometimes people wonder about their salvation when they think about, did I do it the right way? They think, well, did I pray the right way? They say, oh, I didn't pray with somebody. Am I meant to pray out loud? Maybe I didn't say the right words. You know, but this, this calling upon the name of the Lord, it doesn't matter how you do it. You know, it doesn't have to be an audible prayer. There are no magical words. As long as you call out to God and you speak to God and say, hey, save me. You know, different ways in the Bible have been, have been mentioned. You know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And even the thief on the cross, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It doesn't even make sense, right? Because that's like thousands of years later that's going to happen. But he called upon the Lord and the Lord saw his faith that he was trusting Jesus Christ. And he was saved. So the, the way we call upon the Lord is not important. As long as we call upon him by faith. As long as we have done that. But people get caught up in the details rather than just making sure that it is done. So calling upon the Lord does not necessarily have to be heard by others or done in a certain way. But it does need to be done. And I would liken it this way. It would be like if Jesus was outside, right? And I said to him, I said to you, hey, if you go to that man and get eternal life from him, ask him, you know, get eternal life from him, then you can be saved. And if you just stay in here and just say, yeah, yeah, I, I know he's capable of saving me, I don't think that's enough to be saved, even though you recognize the capability of him saving you. It's when you actually go out to him and say, I, I need eternal life. So that's how you would do that spiritually, because you can't actually physically go to Jesus. How you spiritually do it is you call upon him. So really, believing and calling upon Jesus are really two sides of the same coin. Because when you believe on him, somehow you have to reach out to him. Right? It's just not a, an acknowledgement of his capability. It's actually going to him and coming to him for something. What about <clears throat> the way people hear the gospel? So some people doubt their salvation about the circumstances because they say, you know, well... You know, I, I just, you know, I didn't have somebody preach it to me or I didn't walk down an aisle and get saved and I didn't, you know, all these different circumstances. They, say, they might say, well, I just, 
watched a video on YouTube, you know, that, that I, was, I was browsing on YouTube and something came up and it led me to this video and this video and then I got to this video and then there was a plan of salvation and then I got saved. That's how I understood it. And they're like, well, am I saved? Because can you get saved through a video? Doesn't somebody need to preach it to you? Because doesn't the Bible say, you know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And they're like, well, nobody physically came to me and preached to me. So people wonder about that as well. Because they're saved through media. Can you get saved through media? I believe so. I believe it's possible to get saved through media. However you hear the gospel, you know, maybe you got it from watching a video, listening to audio, maybe you read it on a website. Maybe you read a gospel tract, and that's what spoke to you. So people ask, like, do I believe gospel tracts can reap somebody? Is it possible for a gospel tract to reap somebody? I believe it's possible. I believe when people read it, as long as it's got God's word in there, God's word is speaking to them even as they read it. And somebody had to create that tract. So that's why I believe that's, you know, without a preacher is because God uses us to get the word out there. But I believe there are ways, different ways people can be reaped, even though some are more effective than others. Now, somebody might say, well, tracks don't talk, you know, websites don't talk. Uh, or like, uh, you know, maybe you're reading a, a book and it's like, well, the book doesn't talk. Well, I would, I would, um, I would challenge that idea. Because I do think the Bible does mention that even though things are written, they are speaking to you when you read them. In 2 Peter 3, it says here in verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So you see how he's, he's referring back to Paul's epistles. And always, you should always note this passage, because sometimes when you talk to Muslims, Muslims believe that Christianity was just like something that was taken off by Paul, right? But in 2 Peter 3, we see here that the Apostle Peter, which was one of the 12, right? Because they believe like Jesus was a Muslim, taught his disciples Islam, but then Paul came along later after Jesus had died and rose again and then changed Christianity to, to what it is today. But we see here that an epistle written by Peter actually is acknowledging Paul's writings as scripture and saying, hey, God has revealed this unto him, this wisdom given unto him, hath written unto, he, unto you. Also in all his epistles, look at this, speaking in them of, thing, of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruct, uh, destruction. So that's why I believe even in written form, I think it requires people like us to create that media and get that media out there. But I do believe it's possible for somebody to get saved by reading something. Now you might ask the question, well, if somebody can just get saved by reading a gospel tract, why don't we just like send Australia Post out and just like, you know, deliver all the gospel tracts and then that's how we can be more effective. Well, just because I believe it's possible for somebody to read a gospel track and get reaped, that doesn't mean I believe that that's the most effective way for somebody to hear the gospel, right? So there are more effective ways for people to hear the gospel, and that's why we go out and, and engage them. Why? Because the Bible says there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You know, generally when people just get something that they have to read, maybe they put it aside, or they throw it in the trash, they don't read it. But if somebody knocks on their door, that might be the trigger that says, you know what, I'm going to pay attention because somebody's coming to my door to talk to me or somebody's approached me and asked me about this. So it gets them thinking about it. That's why people sometimes say, oh, you know, like, they say, oh, I, I remember once we went soul winning and a guy said, ah, oh, you know, you don't have to go out here and, and you know, talk to people. You know, people, people it's, we live in the information age. If people want to find out about how to find God, how to be saved, they'll look it up on the internet. And then I said to him, well, you weren't thinking about it before I spoke to you today. You know, like, so people don't. People don't. People aren't just generally, this is the truth, right? People aren't just going about their day normally just thinking about God, thinking about how to be saved. You know, sometimes something happens in somebody's life, but it had to sort of trigger them to think about that. Otherwise, people are busy with their life. I mean, you think of even us who acknowledge salvation, we're busy in life. Busy with work, busy with family, busy with all the stresses that we have. You know, we're busy. But that's why sometimes it's good that just out of the blue, somebody stops you and just says, hey, have you ever thought about 
where you're going when you die. And that's why it's more effective to go out there and preach the gospel because that's our job, to try and persuade people. We're giving them another chance to try and believe and, be, and, and be convinced. So we want to be as effective as possible. That's why we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So yeah, while we could just rain down tracks from helicopters, you know, that'll probably just upset people and it's littering as well. But it's, that's not most, the most effective way to get a message across. So we need to think about engaging people. And that's why I like to go talk to them. Now the Bible says here in Jude 22 and 23, and of some have compassion. Look at this. Making a difference. So you see how like when you talk to people and you engage them, just think about in your own life. If somebody did not bring it up to you, didn't that make a difference? It altered the course of your eternity because somebody did something about it. Somebody made the effort, created that content, reached out to you, went out there, knocked on your door. Man, it made a difference. That's why we're not Calvinists here. We don't believe God's just pulling all the strings and no matter what we... It's just all, just all planned out. No, when you go out and you preach the gospel, you make a difference to somebody's life. And you could go out there and somebody is on their way to hell and because of your encounter with them and the Bible that you preach to them, now they're going to heaven. Man, we make a difference. That's why we want to be as effective as we can. Don't just go soul winning with a blasé attitude and just think I'm just going through the motions because that may be one and that's like another opportunity when you speak to that person to change their mind. And you want to change their mind for the better, not for the worse. Right? Don't push them further away from salvation. You want to bring them closer to salvation. So we really need to consider how we go about soul winning. I know it's, you know, you can't always control somebody's reaction, but you want to do the best you can. Others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So that's the first one. The first one was circumstances. It's different events leading up to people's salvation. People wonder, oh, did I do it the right way? Like, like we all came here different ways. As long as you walk through that door, as long as you believe. Number two is emotion. Emotion. People judge their salvation by how they feel. They'll say something like this, oh, but I didn't feel any different when I got saved. Man, hey, neither did I. You know, I got saved in my apartment um, you know, after a gospel rally. I remember the preacher asked me when I wanted to pray with him, and I said, oh, no, I'll think about it a bit more. I went home, read a gospel tract, and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to call upon the Lord. So that I remember I was in my um, apartment that I shared with my brother that night in um, 2005, and that's when I got saved. And you know, there wasn't any rushing mighty wind coming through the house. You know, I wasn't just like overflowed with tears and just like, you know, I was just broken. No, I just, it's the same. The, the, you know, I, I didn't feel any different. But you know what changed? My faith. I believed something different that night. And that's what made the difference. So if some people say, I didn't feel any different. Like, you know, I shouldn't, you know, I, I, I watch these videos and people are bawling their eyes out and they're all broken and they're down at the altar. And, you know, I just, me, it's, you know, some people are just, Emotional, some people don't. So some people, you know, you may or may not have a great emotional experience before or after you call upon the Lord. Personally, for me, it was just an intellectual decision for me rather than an emotional one. Some people are driven by emotion. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because like I said, it doesn't matter how you get to the door as long as when you get there, you believe on Jesus Christ. Some people, it's because of an emotional reason they get to that door. But if they walk through it through faith, they're still saved. Now, there are preachers out there, there are people out there that put a lot of emphasis on sorrow and conviction, like how you have to feel before you get saved, and you have to be broken and all that. Now, I agree to a certain extent in the sense that it can be more effective, easier for somebody to get saved, the more broken they are. Why? Because the Bible says here, in James 4, it says in other places as well, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So for those that are humble and more broken, generally people that acknowledge the, the extent of their sinfulness, it's easier for them to get saved than somebody that doesn't think, you know, they think they're all right. They think they can make it. They think they can bridge that gap themselves. It's not somebody that's necessarily going to get saved easily. So we need to be humbled and realize that we are sinners before God. Now, 
how you respond emotionally to salvation, it's, it's arbitrary, isn't it? It's a bit relative because it can depend on a few things. One thing that it can depend on is your understanding of different sins. You see, in Romans 7, Paul writes here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now sometimes the, 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 the guilt that you feel is just sometimes to the extent of your knowledge. You know, because as you grow in your faith and you grow in knowledge of, of the different commandments and the, and the standard by which God wants us to live, you start to learn how more sinful you are. So isn't it interesting in this Christian life, as you grow in your faith, you do not actually get more confident in yourself. You actually depend more on God because you learn more about how sinful you are. So that's why maybe sometimes when somebody just gets saved, they acknowledge they're a sinner, but they don't feel so bad about it because they don't know the extent to which their sin is deserving of punishment. But as they grow in their faith, their conviction and their contrition grows. Because why? Their knowledge of what is expected of them grows as well. So that's one thing it can depend on. The other thing is, it can depend on the type of sins in your life or the amount of sin in your life. Now, some people are more sinful than others. And if you're more sinful, generally you may have more of an emotional response. Luke 7 this is a story of the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. It says, you know, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him. Look at this, weeping. She's very emotional, isn't she? Began to wash his feet with tears. And he wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him, had asked to invite him over for uh, something to eat, him saw it, saw this woman, he spake within himself. So right, this is not something that he spoke out loud. Right? This is just something he's thinking in his heart, but Jesus knows his thoughts. This man, if he were a prophet, so you can see here that he's obviously doubting of Jesus, who Jesus is, would have known who and what manner of woman this, that this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. You know, maybe she was a prostitute, who knows, right? But I'm, I'm guessing she was a prostitute, right? So it's the people think, oh, she's a prostitute, she's fornicate, she's unclean. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. So there's interest, interest. this shows Jesus' deity. Like it's only if you're God can you know what somebody's thinking. I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the under other 50. So if you think about it, a pence in these days is a day's earnings, right? So we're not talking about one cent. This is like 500 days of work as opposed to 50 days of work. And when they had nothing to pay, so both of them are unable to pay this debt, he frankly forgave them both. That's a picture of salvation, right? Because different people have different amounts of sins but through faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus paid for all sin. doesn't matter how much sin you had, it's all paid for by the uh, creditor. Is it? Creditor. Yep. He frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, look at this, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. So isn't that an interesting thing that the more sins you have, generally the more you appreciate that you've been forgiven. But also, you know, like I said, as you grow in your Christian life and you realize the extent of your sin, the fact that you still sin every day, 
that, that helps you grow in your love for God as well. I'm not saying go out and sin so that you can grow your love. I'm just saying your natural sin every day, you know, that you do and you fall and you, you know, you're doing what you shouldn't do and you know you shouldn't like that struggle that Paul talks about. You know you should be doing right, but you don't. And the more you dwell on that, you think about that and you think, man, God still loves me, you realize, see, we're so sinful and yet God still loves us. Your love for God will grow. Maybe it's a, a negative feeling, right? So somebody might say, well, if I'm saved, why am, I, why am I feeling so negative? You know, insert negative feeling here. I don't know, whatever that feeling is. You say, oh, if I'm saved, why am I feel this? Why do I feel depressed? Why do I feel this? Or why do I feel anxious or nervous? Or, you know, oh, I feel sad all the time. But you see, like, emotions, they, they're arbitrary and relative. And these are, these are these, these measures. See, how can you know that you're saved. If you can never have a definite point that you know you've reached it. So if salvation is judged by emotions, then you've got to ask the question, well, how good do you need to feel until you're truly saved? I mean, isn't that, that's a relative measure, right? Well, what, what is a good feeling? That's different to different people. So how good do you have to feel until you know that you're saved? If faith is judged by emotion, how long do you need to feel good after you're saved, to know that you're saved. You see how these are just all, it's all arbitrary, right? And I remember I was caught up in that once. I remember telling a friend ages ago, I had to like correct myself, saying like, hey, I'm sorry, I told you this is wrong. Or I said, you know, if you're saved, you know, you have different feelings. You know, you feel something or you, you desire something different. And I'll get onto that one in a moment. But no, it's, it's arbitrary. Now, obviously the gospel is good news, so you would expect that people are positive about it, but how positive they are and how long they're positive about it depends on their situation, depends on things happening in their life. So if you say, if I'm saved, why am I feeling so whatever a negative feeling? You know, this is a foolish way to think because, you know, the Bible's very clear that we shouldn't trust our own heart. Our heart can deceive us. So if we are looking to our heart for assurance of salvation, it's not a very solid rock to put it on if your heart can deceive you. Look at what Proverbs 28, 26 says. He that trusteth his own heart is a fool. And whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Look at this in Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which parteth us all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So our hearts need to be kept right by god so it's not something you want to put your put your you know put your assurance on and think oh, this is what i'm going to judge my salvation on if it's like that so you can't trust your heart that's one thing when it comes to hey if i'm saved why am i feeling this way second thing is you know you can you can um what do i say you can feel good without faith i look what the bible says here about moses by faith moses when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, look at this, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So you see, an unbeliever can have a pleasant life. You know, sin, sin can be pleasant for a season. Right? There are consequences. You know, that's generally where the pleasures start to cease. But do you see how you can have good feelings without being saved? And likewise, as a saved person, you can have bad feelings. So you see, if you can be saved and have bad feelings, therefore it shouldn't be a way you judge your salvation. Now did you notice here in John 14, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Ghost, you may know him as the Comforter. Now why is he called the Comforter if there isn't anything to comfort us about? So that's why as, as believers, you can have bad feelings. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. It's to comfort us. I'll just go on for, just for the sake of time. Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You see, if rejoicing was automatic, why would, why would it need to be commanded? So you see, when people say, yeah, well, if you're saved, you're just going to have the joy of the Lord, you're going to be tapping your shoes and just never have a dull moment anymore, that's, that's salvation. That's a lie. 
right? Because we're commanded to rejoice because it's not automatic, because life can be hard. You know, life as a Christian should be hard, right? Because when you live for God, sometimes persecution and tribulation comes with that. So if rejoicing was automatic, it wouldn't need to be commanded. So first one was circumstances, second one was emotion. Third one is your desires, right? Your desire to do right or your desire to do wrong. Somebody might say, well, if I'm saved, why do I still have such a strong desire to sin? I thought when I get saved, I'm going to be free from the shackles of sin. And I'm just like, never want to sin anymore. I just want to do what's right. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because we have the sin and we have the, the flesh and the spirit. So to judge your salvation by your, the extent of your desires or the lack of your desire, the desire to do right, desire to do wrong, how can you judge by that when we have both in our lives? Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Look at this. So these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. So again, why would we be commanded to walk in the Spirit if when we get saved, it's just something that happens automatically? Like sometimes people will say things silly like this and just say, well, once you get saved, you know, you, this, your life is going to change. It's just automatically going to change. No, no, it's not automatic. I wish it was automatic. And I wish I just got up in the morning, just felt like doing right all the time, never wanted to sin, never wanted to think a bad thought or look at a bad thing. Man, if it was automatic, life would be a lot easier, i tell you what. Living for God would be a lot easier. But you know why living for God is hard? Because it's not automatic. Right? If it was automatic, it'd be easy. If it was automatic, we wouldn't need to be exhorted and reminded to walk in the Spirit. So this idea that people just you know, automatically change after they get saved is, is false. Right? We need to decide. We need to take up our cross daily. Look at what Paul says when he talks about this this struggle that he has. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of sin, but with the flesh, uh, uh, the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So Paul is describing this struggle. Even Paul describes this struggle. Now again, like with emotion, desires is ar it's an arbitrary standard because you need to ask the question if desires is a measure of how I judge my salvation how I judge my faith to what extent do I need to have the desire to, to do that right thing do I need to have a perfect desire now this is a quote by Charles Spurgeon that I don't agree with. Right? I, I doubt whether this man is saved because he writes a lot of things that are work salvation. You know, having to repent of your sins and, and this is his mindset. Like this is something that used to, used to get shared with us when I was in the first church I was in trying to encourage us to go soul winning. And I think this is the wrong way to encourage people to go soul winning. But he says this, Have you no wish for others to be saved now that's a good question to ask, right? That's a question that we should all ask ourselves. But then he goes on to say, then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Now why is it wrong? Because he is judging salvation by your desires. Now how much do you need to desire others to be saved until you're not saved? Did you have to have a perfect desire? Doesn't that mean you'll be doing it then? Because then you say, well, if you're not doing it, and you don't really have the desire, maybe you're not saved. You know, so how much, that, that's what it ultimately turns into, right? It always turns into, when it's like, you, need, you, need, you just need a desire, you know, it's a desire to do right. You know, you, just, you don't need to go to church to be saved, right? To know that you're saved. You just need the desire to go to church. But then if you don't go to church, you know what they say? They say, you don't really desire to go to church because if you desire, you'll be there. So it's just like, so it just, it just ends up it's desiring, being willing to change. It's just work salvation wrapped up in another boat. Because ultimately, if you don't do it, then you, the desire wasn't there. But this is the wrong way to encourage people to go soul winning. Because this is teaching a works 
salvation. Now, I want believers to go soul winning, to win souls as much as the next person, right? We all want believers to do right and to win souls, be effective for Jesus Christ, grow. But I'm not going to teach work salvation in order to encourage people to do that. You know, you don't teach people false doctrine, teach people work salvation, make them doubt their salvation just to get them to go soul winning. You don't blackmail them with hell and teach them the wrong doctrines to get them to do spiritual things. Right? They need to do it for the right reasons, with the right doctrine. So we don't lay a foundation that is wrong. And then you have a whole bunch of people in church. Yeah, when you're in church, you feel saved. And then when you're out of church, oh man, maybe I'm not saved. And if you ever have that thought in this church, then you need to learn this. You need to learn the right doctrine. Know why you are saved. And some people lie. You know, they tell this lie like, oh, when I got saved, I lost all desire to sin. You know, that's such a lie. Because you know what? If you, if you get saved and you lose all desire to sin, you know what would happen? You wouldn't sin anymore. But the, you know, because the Bible says here the reason why you sin is because you have a desire to sin. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So lust is that desire, right? And when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So do you see that if somebody says, well, when I got saved, I just lost all desire to sin. Are they saying that they're sinless? Right, because the reason why we sin is because we have desires. So if somebody admits they're a sinner, yet says they have no desire to sin, they're lying. Right, because the reason why they sin is because the desire is there. And if they say they have no sin, what does the Bible say? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the person that acknowledges they have sin and yet thinks they have no desire to sin is deceived, deceiving themselves. And the truth is not in us. Right? So recognizing that sin is wrong does not mean that you have no desire to do it anymore. Because we all have the flesh, we all have the desire to do wrong, even though we can recognize that it is wrong to do. Now, number four is works. This is kind of tied in with the desires, right? Works is not how we judge our faith. Do we have true faith only when we have works? And again, you've got to ask the question. If somebody says, have I done enough good works to be saved? Well, what is the standard? If you're judging faith by works, what is the standard? How much works do you need? And people try and use verses to support this idea that if you have true faith, you're going to have works. And they use James 2, and they misinterpret James 2 because they, they, they contradict it with Romans 4. I'm just thinking of this now in my head. I actually don't have it in my sermon. I should have put that in there. But people go to James 2 and say, faith without works is dead. And what they don't understand is James 2 is your faith in the eyes of men. How you show your faith to men. Yeah, if you want to show your faith to another person, there needs to be works there, right? Because they can't see your faith. But Romans 4 teaches that you don't show your faith to God by works, right? That's why it says, Abraham, if you are justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Because God can see our faith. So they're misunderstanding James 2. But they'll turn to other passages like Matthew 7 and they'll say, Oh, you know, the Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. And they say, these fruits are your works and this is how you know you're saved. And the funny thing is, when they go to passages like this in order to try and prove that the evidence of salvation is works, it would ultimately prove that you're not saved if they interpret the passage the way they do. Why? Because it says here, even so, in verse 17, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. So that's the one they like, right? They say, see, if you're saved, you're a good tree, you're going to bring forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So just focus on verse 18. If somebody takes this passage, rather than understanding it as the flesh and the spirit, the new man and the old man, the good tree and the bad tree that we all have, 
as a saved believer in this life right now and they take it as the whole Christian and they say, hey, you're going to know somebody saved because they have good fruit. Well, the Bible says here, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. So if you have bad fruit, does that mean you're not saved? So you see how they're misapplying, they're misunderstanding these verses. They try and use verses like this in order to support their position that you need works as evidence of faith. But if, you, if that was the case, in which these verses would just prove none of us are saved because we all have evil fruit. It's the same in 1 John 3. This is my favorite one when people start going down this passage because I say, you know, especially I had one guy I, I spoke to recently that said and kind of went to 1 John 3 and said, you know, see, if you're saved, you're, if, you're, if you're born of God, you're going to be doing righteous things. It says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Yeah, but then I said to him, like, well, you've got to read the rest of the passage, right? If you're trying to interpret it that way, then read the rest of the passage and you'll see that it will just, this passage will just prove you're not saved either. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So you see, if somebody's trying to prove that you have to have works in order to be saved and using this passage, does it mean you're not saved if you have sin? No, because they're misapplying this passage as saying, hey, this is how you judge whether you know you're saved, as opposed to recognizing the old man and the new man. So this passage is about knowing the new man that is born of God, because the new man does righteousness, and knowing the old man that commits sin. But if you take it as the Christian as a whole, and you say, well, as a Christian, you're only going to have good works, and you're saved, and you're, you're going to sin if you're not saved, these, these verses will ultimately just prove that you are not saved. Right? Because who can even do that? And when it comes to works, I mean, what is the standard? Anybody that promotes this idea that you have a standard of works, and that's how you prove salvation, They've just set an arbitrary bar. What I mean by arbitrary, it's just like wherever they want to set it. And you know what happens? Generally, people who promote this sort of doctrine set that, set that works bar just low enough so that they can jump over it. Because nobody's going to set the bar so high if they're teaching this doctrine. They're not going to set the bar so high that they're not saved. right? They like say, you've got to do all these things. And I'm like, I'm not even doing them. I'm not even saved. No, generally it's things that they're doing, right? They're going to church, maybe they're reading their Bible, maybe they're going soul winning once a week, you know, things that are outward, maybe in appearance, clothing and whatnot. I don't listen to the bad music. But do they, do they love God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength every moment of every day? I mean, what about all the things that they don't do? Because the standard of works is perfection in the Bible. Whenever there's a standard of works, it's always perfection. That's why it's something we strive for, but it's not something we can accomplish. And that's why we need Jesus Christ in order to accomplish it by faith. You know, Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believe it. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And we'll see here in Revelation 21, there shall in no wise enter into it heaven anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, look at this, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you see the standard to get into heaven by works is perfection. And that's why nobody can do it. That's why Jesus Christ died for us. I often say that, you know, I often say that at the door to people when they say things like, you know, I asked them, you know, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And they're like, you know, got to be good, go to church, you know, do right by others, you know. And I say to them, you know, if you could get yourself to heaven by being good, why did Jesus die on the cross? And then they just think, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I guess it's like, what was it? If you, I could get myself to heaven, God didn't have to come and be a man and live a sinless life and die and go to hell for me and rise and again. I mean, it was all pointless. I get myself there. No, the reason why he came, he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, because there was no other way. That's why he died for us. It proves that this is impossible for us to be saved this way. 
Now, somebody might make the objection and say, well, Victor, if the new man does good works, right, and you, can, and you, you um, are looking to see whether the new man's there, wouldn't it make sense that if somebody's doing good works, then you can judge whether the new man's there and then you can use works as a, as a measure of whether they're doing, whether they're safe. Well, the problem with that is you can only know good works because they're done in faith. Because how many people go to church and they're not saved? Is that a good work? No, that's, that's sin. Why? He that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's why you wonder, why does, an, why does the Bible say an unbeliever says all our righteousness are as filthy rags? Because they don't have faith. You need to have faith to please God. You need to do works in faith for them to be good works. Otherwise, it's just filthy rags. So even if somebody is behaving how a Christian should, I mean, the Pharisees were pretty clean. I don't even know about that. The Pharisees, the Bible, Jesus says, except your righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter into heaven. Right? So, scribes, when you looked at them, that's why Jesus said, outwardly, they're like whited sepulchres. But inwardly, they're full of dead men's bones. Why? Because outwardly, they look like they had the works. So you think, maybe, maybe that Pharisee's saved. Because they, they've got the works. But how do you judge the good works? You judge, they go only good works because they're of faith. And that's why we're back to square one, right? It's just, how do we know when we have faith? The last one I want to mention, I added this to my sermon since the last time I preached this, is non-salvational doctrines. Sometimes people doubt their salvation because they disagree on doctrines that are non-salvational. And you get people saying things like this. If you don't agree with insert non-salvational doctrine here, then you must not be saved. What do I mean by a non-salvational doctrine? Maybe it's like, hey, if you don't realize that the world was created in six days, 6,000 years ago, like the Bible teaches, you know, some people, they get saved, they still mix up with evolution. They still think millions of years and all this stuff. And then you tell them, oh, you know, it's so clear in the Bible in Genesis. If you don't understand it, you don't get it, maybe you're not saved. You know, sometimes people say, sometimes people believe in evolution, but they have explanations for Genesis 1. So it's not like they're denying God's word completely, but they have a different doctrinal position on that. I know people that are born again Christians and yet believe in an old earth. And they have all these theories of how they try and get around Genesis 1. But, um, you know, I, I obviously don't agree with it. But I disagree with this statement, that there are non-salvational doctrines that determine whether or not you are saved. Now, what are salvational doctrines? Salvational doctrines would be doctrines to do with who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us to be saved. So John 8, he says here, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So you need to believe Jesus is God. That's why you need to believe he's come in the flesh. Why? Because God was manifest in the flesh. So this is about who Jesus is. The right Jesus is Jesus who is God and also the God of the Bible. Right? So it's not just like any Jesus, not any person named Jesus. You know, it's not just the Jesus of the Quran that didn't die for your sins, not the Son of God. It needs to be the right Jesus is God and what did God do for us is the gospel. Now, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So there are things, the salvational doctrines are the things tied into those two main things. What, who is Jesus? And what was necessary for our salvation? So what are some examples of non-salvational doctrines? Well, it might be the Bible version that you use. You know, we're King James only here. We believe the King James Bible is the right translation and other English translations have been perverted. But if somebody's using another different version, does that mean they're not saved? No. Right? Do they, can they get all the truth? Do they get all the right truth? No. But that doesn't mean they have the wrong Jesus. That doesn't mean they don't understand salvation, what Jesus has done for them. So if they use a different Bible version, you can't make people 
you know, some people have doubted their salvation because they're like, well, I got saved through an NIV. I got saved hearing, you know, an ESV or a different Bible version. So I don't support these different Bible versions. I don't think we should use them. But, you know, honestly, they're not that different when you think about it. I mean, the, the differences are like in the 1%, 2%. So there's still a lot of God's word in there. And if they believe that, they can be saved. So whilst I don't like these other Bible versions and I think that they are corruption and a perversion, I don't believe people can't get saved through them. So Bible versions, maybe it's our understanding of the Trinity. Maybe it's our position on creation, I alluded to that. Maybe it's our position on end times. I mean, I've heard people say things like, oh man, Matthew 24 is so clear. You know, the rapture happens after the tribulation. If you don't get that, you must not be saved. No, you don't judge your salvation by the non-salvational doctrines because then it raises the question of how much doctrine do you need to know until you can be saved? I mean, do you need a perfect understanding of the Bible and understand every you know, revelation of Jesus Christ that is possible to know on this earth and then only you know you're saved? No, that's an impossible standard to reach. So we don't judge our salvation by these things. So just a recap, it's not our circumstances, it's not how we feel, our emotion, it's not our desires, right? It's not the works that we do where we judge whether or not we have faith, and it's not our full doctrinal positions on all non-salvational issues, you know, how we dress, you know, whether we have musical instruments in church or not. I've heard ones like that before. So what is the evidence? I'll close on this, and hopefully some of you may already know this, but hopefully this is an eye-opener for the rest of you. What is the evidence of faith? How do I know that I believe? And it's a lot more simple than you think. Hebrews 11. Look at what the Bible says here. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the evidence. And you might think like, man, that just... Why did you just do this big circle just to get back to the being? Because sometimes it takes a while to undo all the false teaching. Faith is the evidence. What is not seen? Not seen is salvation. The eternal life is not seen. What is the evidence of that thing that is not seen? It's the faith. So when you ask the question, how do I know I believe? What is the evidence of faith? It's actually an illogical question. Why? Because evidence doesn't have evidence. Does that make sense? Let me give you an analogy. Let's say I'm married, right? You don't see the covenant between me and my wife. What's the evidence that we have a covenant? This, right? So we put on a ring, it's a tradition, right? So it's not, biblic, it's not necessarily a Bible thing. It's just tradition. People put on a ring and it represents, it signifies the invisible covenant. That's the evidence of what's not seen. And let's say I asked you, well, what's the evidence that, of the ring? And you go like, I don't need evidence for the ring because I see the ring. I see the ring, therefore that's the evidence of what I don't see. So you see how it doesn't make sense for me to ask, well, show me the evidence of the evidence. <laughs> right? So that's why when it comes to salvation, the evidence of salvation is faith. So to say, what's the evidence of faith? How do I know I believe? That doesn't make sense because faith is the evidence. Now, why can faith be evidence? Because you can see your faith. That's why nobody else can judge your salvation, right? I can only, to the best of my ability from what you say, judge whether or not you're saved. But you can see your faith perfectly. Why? Because you see what you believe. That's why God knows you're saved. God can see that you believe on Jesus because God can see your faith. And you can know that you're saved. Why? Because you can see your faith. You know what you believe. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, you can know you have eternal life. That's why the Bible says, these things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, you know that you believe. Why? Because you know your thoughts. You know what you're thinking right now. You think, maybe you're thinking, why is Victor drilling in this point? So I get it. I'm glad you get it. Because I want you to get it. That's why I'm drilling it in. Because this is very important. 
Because you know why? Because when people doubt their salvation, you know what it does? It like just totally removes their effectiveness as a witness for Jesus Christ. How can, how can you preach the God? How can you give somebody else and say, like, this is how you can know that you're going to heaven? Let me share it with you. When in your own heart you're thinking, man, I don't even know if I'm going to heaven. <laughs> and that's why you need to know that you're going to heaven so that when you share it with somebody else, you're not thinking, oh, man, I'm so sinful in my life. I'm not, I'm not feel saved right now. I'm not going to give the gospel. Oh, I'm feeling down. Maybe I'm not saying I'm not going to give the gospel. There's all these factors come in of why people don't want to share the gospel but when you understand this point and you understand you can know with 100 percent surety that you're going to heaven because you can see your faith if you have the faith you can know you're going to going to heaven it doesn't matter when you go soul winning it doesn't matter what else is happening in your life how you feel what's going on you know what your desires are you can still preach the gospel with power with confidence because your confidence is not in you it's on Jesus Christ, in whom your faith rests. That's why faith is the evidence. That's why you can know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So the evidence of salvation. It's not circumstances, not emotions, it's not our desire, it's not works, it's not non-salvational doctrines, it's your faith. Faith is the evidence. Evidence doesn't require evidence, because you can see your faith. All right, I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the assurance you give us in Jesus Christ. That, Lord, you don't leave us wondering whether we're saved or not. If we believe on him, we can know we believe because we can see our faith. And we can know, therefore, Lord, that we have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that we can never lose our salvation once we believe on Jesus. That no matter what happens in this life, we will always be saved if we put our faith on him. And no matter what happens in this life, Lord, we can always preach the glorious truth that we are saved eternally through our faith on Jesus Christ to others. So I pray, Lord, this sermon uh, is internalized by the people here. It's edified the people here. And uh, we thank you for this assurance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>